I started as a barber at uh, the age of, I think, 16, 17 during that time. I was into hip hop. Hip hop was like the biggest thing in my life. I loved the, I loved the Nas days. So I was like, hmm, how do I get that haircut? How do I ask for that haircut that, you know, you the cut that you really want? So luckily I went to this urbanized hip hop barbershop and I was like, hey man, can you do this haircut? He's like, what haircut? I said, Nas. He's like, no, I got you. And this is where I became a little cocky, you know, you start feeling the flow, looking really, fro really fly and fresh. And then I'm like, man, I want this haircut again. But the haircut was actually a little bit expensive. Luckily, my mom was a petition and she had some clippers, but the clipper was the most piece of crap I ever had. And I, it hurt me and I cut myself and I'm like, this is not it. This is not the clipper that I want. So I asked my mom, like, mom, can you help me buy this clipper down the block that I like? And she's like, okay, this is the way you want to cut your own hair? I was like, perfect. So my mom got me the clipper and uh, I started doing two all around and escape aid. When I was in school, people were looking at me like, yo, where'd you get the haircut? And I was like, I did it. They're like, for real? I said, you want a haircut? He's like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I did it, I did it for free. I started charging haircuts for like five dollars in my in my kitchen, and my mom was like, "Wow, this is a lot of kids." So I went back to the barber shop, got another dope fade, and asked, "Where can I go for school for for barbering?" It's like, yeah, you go to the spot in downtown the city, it's a place called Atlas Barbershop uh, School. I went in and I applied. They asked me, "Do you know how to do skin fades and shapers and tapers?" And I said, "Yes, I do." I was like, oh, so you're pretty advanced. I was like, yes, I am. I think I am. But I'm here to learn what you guys could offer me. That they love me so much that they put me in front of the store and I started getting more walk-ins. I advanced so much that they already gave me my certificate to cut hair. You know, during the time, there was like no Asian barbers. There, I was, I'm the only Filipino barber in my community that was doing really big for themselves. I was telling my mom, like, mom, I don't feel wanted at all. She's like, then you should work in the salon. When I was in the salon, I felt like this is not me. I started doing design in the new shop that I opened called Filthy Rich. I got this word filthy for men in Seattle. They use this nickname, like, you know, you know how fresh, dope, that shit is filthy. That kind of gave me a ring, you know? And then he was like, your cuts, bro, is filthy rich. In 2006, Filthy Rich started becoming its own brand name. The barbershop was pretty much me. I've actually been working by myself for four years from there. I created design, the NYC the, uh, design in the back, and I posted up on MySpace. From, from there, it went viral. Like A lot of people started knowing what my design looked like and where, where can they get the haircuts like this. I took social media as an advantage, so I started getting people from all over the globe coming to me from different parts of the city. My business got bigger and bigger, so I needed to open and advance my shop to a bigger place. So now here, here we are with a bigger spot. This is Filthy Rich Barbershop. I've been a barber for more than 15 years and I love this business so much that business that I'll die for. The reason why I got into cutting hair, my dad only gave me four haircuts a year growing up, and it was the worst haircuts of them all. And I actually used to get haircuts with my cousin, who was a, a hairstylist, and my haircuts consisted of a scissor and a cereal bowl, and it was called uh, the bowl cuts. Uh, five years into working at Estilo's Barbershop, also doing a lot of freelancing, uh, working at Frank's Chop Shop, uh, and another spot called Hello Beautiful, I built like a crazy clientele. and. Um, I decided uh, to step on my own, and it got to the point that I know I can control a barbershop and pay for it myself, I can open up a shop. The formula to opening up a, like, a successful barbershop is either kind of being like consistent and confident. As long as I've been owning or even cutting, I'm the first person in the last person out at all times. If it's open up at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm there at 8.30 setting up, leaving at like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. The industry's definitely changed a lot, definitely through like social media from like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, now Snapchat. Your eyes are open to so many different like styles and haircuts and like learning so many new things. Like somebody who, who didn't notice me that lives in say the Bronx, see me in, like on an Instagram page and saw like one of my dope like designs or like me cutting like a celebrity and I was like, yo, I need to go check that barber out and they'll come make their way down here. I've done have guys come from like California, come get haircuts and wait three, four months. So it's like, just depends on the type of barber you are to get that type of clientele. A barbershop means the community, especially in New York, everything. People need to get jobs, so they look fresh. People need to go out, so they want to look fresh. People won't always want to look at their best. I love being a barber because it's, it's like I like making people look good. Kind of like changing, changing like people's atmospheres and changing their aura. You never know. So, talking to clients, you're kind of like the therapist, and you're over here like, chopping it up with them, seeing what type of day they had. Sometimes people have like really bad days, shitty days, and getting a haircut could just 
switch it up. I remember I was going to this barbershop called uh, Martin's and this old woman, Spanish woman, I think her name was like, I think her name was like Marie. My dad sat me down to get a haircut. I'm like, why are you sitting me down with a lady and you're getting a haircut with like, you know, Martin at the barbershop? And she gave me like the best skin fade ever. I think that was the only time I got like a decent skin fade from like the age of like eight years old to like 12. And after that, I was like, it's, it's time to go braids. And I grew like long ass braids. But that was like the first experience. And she put like the blade to my neck and it was like, it was like the best haircut I've had until like I turned like 18. I'm trying to see the industry progressing like, this, uh, let's say with products, machines. You know, we have, nowadays there's so many, so many products out there. You have Pacinos, which is a great like product that he has. Uh, Exotics has great products. But then you have like a bunch of bullshit watered down products that people are just trying to force in your face. American Cool, these high end brands. I'm trying to see like the people that I worked with that literally like, starting from the bottom actually make it to the top. Kind of like all these top brands that are in, like in Target and Walmart. If you're cutting hair, just keep doing it. And if you if you think you suck, keep practicing because I sucked before. Now I'm I'm gonna have a barber shop in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and I've done cut over 80 celebrities. Sky's the limit. Don't ever stop cutting, don't ever stop dreaming. Dollar in a dream? Trust me, I had a dollar and I'm dreaming it now. There's always definitely goals and there's ambitions definitely working. I started cutting hair around, uh, I'd say about 12 years old. I used to have this friend on my block, uh, his name was Mario, and he used to give everybody shape ups on the block. I was always bugged out of how much money he used to make, so I wanted to do it, so he taught me how to give lineups. I started giving all my friends lineups. I started working in this barbershop. I was 13 years old, they had me sweeping the floors, they had me cleaning everybody's stations, prepping the towels, making sure everything was where it needed to be at, and I started cutting out at a French shop, this Dominican barber shop in Astoria, Queens. They taught me how to do all machine work, everything I needed to know, to know about machine work, but in the previous barber shop on 81st and Roosevelt, they had taught me everything I needed to know from shaves to scissor cuts. You know, machine work was good. They were good with their machine work, but their scissor work and their blade work were, were really, really good. A couple years passed by and I already, you know, mastered the shaves. I got really good with scissor cuts. And the Dominicans taught me how to fade and they were also good with, with shaves. So I just put two and two together and I just decided to go out and try different things. Uh, start looking for events to do. Start just looking for any little thing. So I went out to the city and I got a, I landed me a job at a barbershop called Mustache Grand Stonsorio. And I met some of the best barbers I've ever met in my life. I was born and raised in this neighborhood, uh, Story of Queens, man. And this neighborhood has always been like, like a neighborhood. It's not like city. Everybody knows everybody. It's families everywhere and everybody's just in tune with each other. But at the same time, you know, it has this diversity. It's like, uh, you know, Italians in one side, Greeks in the other side, Russians in another side, Spanish people put in one side, the Arabs put in another side. But everybody knows everybody. So, you know, just wanted to bring that into the neighborhood where I was raised at. Because at the same time as I was working out in the city, and the prices I were charging were exponentially a lot higher than what I'm charging now. We charge a little more than the barbershops like around the way, but we give a lot better service to everybody. A kid usually goes to the barbershop at around the age of like 12 year olds to like 20 year olds, 21 year olds go to barbershops. You know, they usually come around, they, they sweep up, they hang out in the shop. After you get to know them better, you start analyzing how their work ethics are. See if they really want it. See if they really want to learn. Cause if not, you're just wasting your time. And it's, you know, it's like an investment. You buy yourself something to eat, you can't just have the kid watch you eat something, you gotta buy him something to eat. You know, a kid has to go to the train, or he has to take the bus, you give him the money for the bus. A year of watching them, a year of just reading them, that's when you usually start teaching them the craft. But in the meantime, you show them every something a little here and there, you show them, you know, how to shave, make them shave a balloon, see if they like to do it, you know. This craft is beautiful. It really is art if you look at it, the fading, the scissor work, just like the beauty of what it is to like, you know, lift somebody's head up. They have that the nice line going on their jaw, you know, they got good beard going on and that shave, that really close shave. When you see that razor take off all that hair, boy. Oh my God. It's impressive. It's really, it's like super impressive because not everybody could do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you know when the back is faded out natural, it's like nice and lined up and you see that fade from that natural going, it's when it's clean, you respect it. I just love barbering. I just love it. I love everything about it. The scissor work, the texture on top, when you texturize it, 
You know what I love about this job? The conversations you have with people. You just, you make friends everywhere, man. These friends right here will be some of the closest friends you ever meet ever in your life.